Welcome to this online lecture that includes the topic scientific notation, measurement, and density. Scientific notation is used when we have really, really, really big numbers or really, really, really small numbers. Because if we have really, really big or small numbers, that means we have a lot of zeros. And writing zeros can be really cumbersome um, when we're doing calculations and measurements and such. So instead of writing all of those zeros, what we're going to do is we're going to use scientific notation. So for example, if we have this number here for seconds, 0 0.000000000001 second, instead of saying to somebody, look, that took 0 0.000000000001 second. We can say, all right, that measurement is 1 times 10 to the negative 15 seconds, okay? Which um, is going to make it easier for us to communicate when we're talking about measurements and uh, doing calculations. Um, the same thing with, you know, really big numbers as we see here in uh, light years, okay? 14 billion light years. Well, we could say, um, instead of saying 14 with nine zeros behind it, we can say 1.4 times 10 to the 10 light years. And so we can see this, this 10 here, by the way, should be a little power 10. Um, so 1.4 times 10 to the 10th power in light years is how we would um, represent 14 billion in scientific notation. So you can see that in scientific notation, these numbers right here, um, scientific, scientific notation always consists of a decimal part, okay, which is um, the number in front of the times 10 to the, okay, so we have a number that's got to be between 1 and 10, okay, you can see uh, the first one is 1 and the second one is 1.4, so always has to be a number between 1 and 10. If you have a number higher than 10, even 10 point something, then you need to move that decimal over one more time. Um, we also always have an exponent part, okay, um, times 10 raised to an exponent number. So um, that's the two parts of scientific notation. So again, here's a, another example of a number written in scientific notation. We have a decimal part um, here, 1.2, and then we have our exponent part times 10 to the negative 10, okay? Um, now, when we take a look at a number in scientific notation, sometimes it's hard to figure out, is that a small number or is it a big number? Or, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out the degree of the number. So if you can remember that a positive exponent is going to mean that the number is greater than 1. So positive exponent means it is a big number, okay? Um, for example, Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10, again, that should be to the 23rd power, okay, means 602, I don't even know how to say that, okay, with 21 zeros behind it. Um, so that is obviously a really big number, okay? Um, now, if we take a look at a number and it has a negative exponent, that means that the number is less than one. So we haven't hit zero yet, but it is less than one. It is a fraction of a number. So we can see here that if we have a number um, that's 1.0 times 10 to the negative 10th exponent, okay, it is a really small number, okay, 0 0.000000001 meters. So a negative exponent means that it is a small number, a really small number. So if we have a positive exponent, that means we're going to have a big number, okay, greater than one. If we have a negative exponent, it is a small number, it is a decimal number that is smaller than one. All right, so to convert numbers into scientific notation, basically there's two main um, things that we do. We move the decimal point either to the right or to the left until we get a number between 1 and 10. And then we multiply that number by 10 raised to the power that reflects how many positions over we moved that decimal um, point. So 
If we move the decimal point to the left, okay, then we are going to have a positive exponent, okay? Means we're gonna have a big number. So we started off with a big number, so we have to reflect that in a positive exponent. If we move the decimal to the right, that means we started with a decimal number, a really small number, so that our ex exponent needs to have a negative sign um, to tell us that it was a really small number. So let's do a couple of these examples together. All right, so if we have 0 0.0045 millimeters, and we want to express that in scientific notation, here's our decimal point. Okay, that's where we started. We're going to move it over one, two, three spots, okay, until we get a number between 1 and 10. And 4.5 is between 1 and 10. All right, so we're going to say this number is 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3 because we moved it over 1, 2, 3 spots. Okay, so 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3 millimeters is how we would write that in scientific notation. Now, if you see, if we only moved it, the decimal over 1, 2 spots, then we would have a number 0.45, which, again, is not between 1 and 10. And if we moved it over even more, all right, so say we moved it over 4 times, 1, 2, 3, 4, we would get 45 for the front number. Again, not between 1 and 10. So you make sure you're moving your decimal over far enough that you get a number between 1 and 10. And 4.5 is definitely between 1 and 10. All right, so let's take a look at another example. Um, we have, this is the population of the United States of America. Um, 315 million people, okay? So in order to express that in scientific notation, we have to move the decimal point. Now in this number, there is literally no decimal point drawn, but remember if a number doesn't have a decimal point there, it is implied to be at the end of the number, right? So there's our decimal point and we need to move it so that we get a number between one and 10. So we're going to move it over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. Okay, so their decimal point is, makes the number 3.15, okay? And so we moved it over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. So that means our exponent okay, is 10 to the eighth power, all right? And it's a positive exponent for two reasons. One, we moved the decimal over to the left, okay, towards the left, so it needs to be a positive exponent. And number two, remember, positive exponents tell you that the number is really big. This number is definitely greater than one. It's a big number, so we need to have a positive exponent. So 3.15 times 10 to the 8 people is approximately what our population is here in the United States. Again, if we move that decimal place over only 7 times, we would have ended up with a decimal here, which would have been 35.1, which is not between 1 and 10. And if we moved it over even further, okay, 9 places, we would have 0.135 again, which is not between the numbers one and 10. So you gotta make sure uh, that's the most common mistake is that people don't move the decimal over far enough or they move it too far. Always gotta get a number between one and 10. Now let's take a look at our last example. We have 1,300,000 people. Okay, so if we wanted to express this number in scientific notation, right, here's what we do. Our decimal, again, is at the end. It's always, if it's not written, it's always implied to be at the end of the number. And so we're gonna move it over one, two, three, four, five, six times to get the number 1.3, okay? And then we always have to put a times 10 to that. And because we moved the decimal over six times, our exponent is going to be six. And again, it's positive six because we moved it left. 
And because it is this, you know, 1,300,000 is a number that is definitely greater than 1. So um, our exponent needs to be a positive number. So this number in scientific notation is 1.3 times 10 to the 6 people. Okay, we always want to put our units down for sure. So this one is also people. All right, so hopefully that makes sense to you, scientific notation. If you uh, still have questions, please come see me um, tomorrow or the next lecture, and we can, um, I can go over some more examples with you. All right, now that we have a basic understanding of scientific notation and that big numbers and small numbers can be written with a little more ease, let's take a look at measurement. So the, uh, the basic units of measurement. Now by themselves, numbers have very little meaning. If we take a look at this sentence, when my son was seven, we walked three, and when he was four, he could throw a baseball eight and tell us that his school was five away. Okay, um, all right, that means nothing to me. When my, seven, when my son was seven years, seven months, you know, seven weeks, he could walk three miles, three steps, three inches. What, you know, what are you talking about here? So we never, ever, ever, ever write a number by itself. We always have to use units. Okay, so this little sentence makes much more sense when we say my son, when my son was seven years okay, old, we walked three miles, right? And when he was four years old, he could throw a baseball eight meters, perhaps, and tell us that his school was five minutes away, okay? So it makes much more sense if we have units there, not just numbers. So numbers by themselves mean nothing, we always use units. Always write the number with its unit. That is like primo number one rule in science. When we're talking with numbers, always put the unit down. In fact, on tests and quizzes, if you don't put the unit down, guess what? You get marked down <laughs> on your answer. So make sure that you always put your units. All right, so let's take a look at these basic units of measurement, what units we're going to be putting after our numbers. So you have um, <clears throat> are probably familiar with the two common unit systems that uh, exist in this world. We have English and metric. Okay, English used by, guess what, the United States of America, and that's about it these days. And the metric system, which is used by the entire rest of the world. When is the United States going to get on board? Doesn't look like any time soon. Anyways, um, as scientists, and scientists are not just in the United States of America, we have scientists in every country around the world, we use the international system, the SI system, which is based off the metric system. So let's take a look at some of the base units that we're going to be putting behind the numbers uh, in science and in chemistry in particular. So for example, if we are going to measure the base unit of, of a length of something, we're going to use the meters, that is a base unit. And now any base unit is a precisely defined unit. So a meter is defined as the distance light travels in one over 300 millionth of a second. Okay, so Light travels one meter in 3.3 .3 times 10 to the ninth seconds. Okay, that is precisely one meter. Interesting fact there. Um, now, mass is another base unit. Uh, we're going to measure mass in the base unit, the kilogram. Okay, now this is the only base unit where it actually. Um, has a prefix before it. It's not gram, it's actually kilogram, and it should say kilo instead of kilogram. Okay, so this is kilogram, kg. And a kilogram, again, is a 
is precisely defined as the mass of this random block of metal in the, in, uh, the museum, the IBWM Museum, which stands for the International Bureau of Weights and Measurements. So they literally have, and it looks like this, this picture right here, there is a cylindrical piece of metal that weighs exactly one kilogram. Every other measurement of mass is um, actually compared to this one kilogram weight. Interest, again, another little interesting fact. And I bet you didn't know that the base unit of time, which is what we measure in seconds, is um, comes from de the defined unit of uh, the decay of cesium-133 atom. So let's off uh, decay at certain intervals, and we call that uh, those intervals seconds. Okay, so that's where we get our time from. All right, so those are the base units. Length is meter, mass is kilogram, and time is seconds. Now there is a difference between mass of something and the weight of something. Okay, mass is a measurement of the quantity of matter within it. Okay, um, weight, however, is basically how much gravity is pulling on that object. Okay, so here on Earth, we kind of use mass and weight interchangeably, but it, there's a huge difference. If we took, you know, yourself, for example, Okay, if you weigh 150 pounds here on Earth, okay, and you went up to the moon and you weighed yourself, you'd weigh significantly less because there's less gravitational pull on the moon. However, you didn't lose any mass going up to the moon. Okay, you st all of you is still there. You didn't lose any arms or legs or whatever. Um, you, didn't, you don't shrink when you go to the moon. So we don't lose any mass going to the moon, but we definitely have a lower weight. So there's a difference, okay, between mass and weight. Um, just to remember that, um, that, that there is that difference. However, here on Earth, since everything is everything that we measure physically is here on Earth, we may use mass and weight interchangeably. But um, just so you know, that one kilogram of mass is equivalent to 2.2 five pounds of weight here on earth now that ratio would be different on the moon um, obviously so you know one kilogram of mass would be significantly less pounds on uh, the moon so just keep that in mind a great advantage of the SI or metric system is that it employs prefix multipliers with the base units so instead of remembering in, you know, for example, in the um, English unit of measurement for volume, right, we have teaspoons, tablespoons, cups, pints, quarts, gallons, okay, and they all have different, like, number ratios between each other, okay, so like, there's three teaspoons and a tablespoon, but there is two cups to a pint and four pints to a gallon, I think. I don't even know if that's correct. Um, yeah, so we don't have to, in the SI, in the metric system, you don't have to remember all of those uh, different units and the ratios between them. All you got to remember is the prefixes. And there's a lot of them that you already are probably familiar with. Um, these prefixes change the value by powers of 10. All right, so if we take a look at this chart here, it's got um, the prefixes right here, okay? And then you got the symbol for it and the meaning, the numbers, okay? So um, for example, you are definitely should be familiar with kilo, which is means a thousand, okay? Because we have a thousand here, or you know, times 10 to the three. You're also probably um, familiar with deci, Okay, which means a tenth. All right, so you times that number by 0.1. Um, centi is a hundredth. Okay, milli, th these ones are probably very familiar for you. Um, even nano, in this uh, day and age of technology and nanotechnology, um, that's where it comes from, is you know uh, times 10 to the negative ninth power. 
All right. Um, and then also when we're talking about, um, you know, computers and memory storage and stuff like that, we have mega and giga and tera, actually. Um, we've got terabyte, you know, hard drives these days, um, computers and, and other electronic devices work off, you know, iPod might be 32 gigabytes of storage. Giga means times 10 to the nine. Okay. So, um, if you have four gigabyte hard drive, you've got four times 10 to the nine bytes of space available on that, um, technical device. So there's a bunch of prefixes that you are already familiar with. You just might not be familiar with how big it means. So here is a reference um, for you. So anytime we have a base unit, we can, um, if we need a multiplier, okay, to figure out, you know, if it's uh, a big number like mega, tetra, giga, or tera, I should say, and giga, or if it's a, on the smaller side, like deci, centi, milli, nano, okay, you can get kind of the uh, degree of value from this chart. All right, so like we said, base units are specifically precisely defined units, okay? They, um, there is, you know, some kind of specific measurement that that is. Now, we also in science have what are called derived units, which are units that are derived or um, taken from other base units. Basically, you have to multiply or divide different base units together to get these derived units. So if you do any kind of multiplication or division to get a specific unit for um, a number, then that you're working with a derived unit. So for example, if um, you're working with area or volume, okay, you have to do, you know, area is length times width. Okay, so if you've got, you know, two meters by two meters, your area is going to be four meters squared. Okay, so that is a derived unit since you had to do two times two. Okay, meters times meters is squared meters. Um, volume, length times width times height. So if you've got two times, you know, two meters times two meters times two meters, okay, then you've got eight cubic meters um, for volume. You've also seen uh, speed is a derived unit, meters per second, or um, in our cars, we do miles per hour. Okay, all right, MPH. Um, density, which we're gonna talk about next, is also a derived unit, it is uh, kilograms per cubic meter. Okay. Um, and concentration, okay, which you've seen in regular chemistry, moles uh, per cubic meter. There's all kinds of derived units. So basically, if you had to multiply or d divide to get a bit, you know, to get that unit, you've got a derived unit. Okay, rather than just a plain old meter, a plain old kilogram, a plain old second. Okay, so if it's meters per second, meters divided by seconds, that is a derived unit. All right, I think you get it now. Let's move on. To our last topic of the day is density. All right, so you've worked with density before, um, back in high school, back in middle school, um, maybe even elementary school. Density of an object is the ratio of its mass to its volume. All that means is it means that it is mass divided by volume, okay? That is density. Um, it is a fun fundamental property of matter. Each substance has its own density, has its own ratio of mass to volume. In fact, we can identify substances using their density. If we don't know what something is made of, we can take the mass, we can measure the volume, we divide the two, and we can look at and you know look it up on the internet or a huge chart in some scientific you know book somewhere um, that'll tell you exactly what that. Uh, piece of uh, matter is made out of, okay? And it doesn't change for a substance no matter what, okay? So that means if you have a tiny little piece of it or a huge truckload of it, okay, the density is still going to be the same, all right? So if, you know, you have a little tiny, you know, gold pendant on your necklace versus a huge old block of gold that, you know, that you have somewhere sitting, hopefully in a bank vault or something like that, so it doesn't get stolen, 
in any case, the density of both of them, if they're pure gold, is going to be exactly the same. So it doesn't change for a substance no matter what. Okay, whether it's melted, whether it's solid, um, the density is still the same. Now the units for density, remember we, um, we said density is a derived unit. So the units for density we usually use um, are going to be grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, again, my program doesn't like to do a superscript. So that should be per cubic centimeter. So we've got um, grams per cubic centimeter. If you're talking about solid objects, that's what you usually use. Um, if you're talking about liquids, then um, we're going to use liters for volume instead of cubic centimeters. So we'd also have um, grams per liter. And that's usually for, again, for for uh, liquid substances, or if you have to measure um, the volume of something really small, and you have to use uh, water displacement. Okay, you'll use grams per liquid. I'm um, not liquid. <laughs> grams per liter. Hello. Um, and we usually use grams because um, in chemistry, uh, we're going to not be using you know truckloads of sub of you know mat matter or substances. We're not going to be using kilograms um, worth of stuff. So grams is um, definitely fine. All right, so we've come to the last slide in this uh, lecture, which basically is a you try it kind of slide. Um, and so word problem here, kind of using the density formula as, um, you know, as practice. So it says a jeweler offers to sell a ring to a woman and tells her that is made of platinum. Noting that the ring feels a little light, the woman decides to perform a test to determine the ring's density, which would be weird if you were at like K Jewelers in the mall. Uh, anyways, she finds out that the ring's mass is 5.84 grams because she keeps a scale in her purse. And the volume is a 0 0.0556 centimeters cubed because she's that good at measuring volume. So, is the ring platinum? Now you need to know that the density of the ring is, or I'm sorry, the density of platinum itself is 21.4 grams per cubic centimeter. And again, those threes should be sub superscripts, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do is, again, obviously we're going to use the density formula. Density equals mass divided by volume, okay? So the ring's mass is 5.84 grams, and the ring's volume is 0 0.556 centimeters cubed. So we're going to divide those two numbers to get 10.5 grams per centimeters cubed. So is the jeweler cheating the woman? The answer is definitely yes. This ring is not platinum, for sure. Platinum should have a density of 21.4 grams per centimeters cubed. This only has 10.5 grams per centimeters cubed. This looks more like silver than platinum, okay? So not platinum. Don't buy from whatever jeweler, jeweler, jeweler yikes, I can't talk today, um, she went to because he will definitely be cheating you. All right, so that's how the density formula works. Um, we could obviously derive this uh, or, yeah, derive this um, equation you know, to solve for not just density, but f for example, for mass, right? You could do mass would equal density times volume, okay? You could also um, rearrange it or drive it to solve for volume, which would equal mass divided by density, okay? So you're going to have um, all kinds of different practice problems that have to do with this formula that you may have to um, solve for. Okay, solve for the different variables that are within it. All right, so again, if you have any questions on anything that we've done in this lecture, make sure you ask uh, the next time that I see you.